my name is Amanda and I'm here with I'm Lisa and tonight we are going to be reading for our monthly program literary program one book one night we'll be reading the ocean at the end of the lane by Neil Gaiman this is a really interesting pick it is one of his you know he has kind of a diverse array of genres but there is kind of that Gaiman feeling you know that feeling of his literary style so hence we're wearing our kind of uh, our Neil Gaiman s a little related to this book uh, a little related to that kind of spooky supernatural element of the book in there so let's go ahead and we're going to read this in German and English tonight but before we get into the actual text let's get into our, some of our pre-discussion questions all right. Um, I think our next upcoming is we're going to go into a little bit of our resources. Yeah. So let's get in here. All right. So I'm going to turn my camera off real quick so I'm not hogging up the screen. I am also going to turn my camera off. All right. So we're going to go into a little bit of resource time here. We, you know, we love to talk about all the fun and cool tools that we have at the library. So. I'm throwing this up here as a little idea of how uh, Gale Books and Authors can be useful when you're getting ready for an event that for a book you might not have read before. So you just go to Gale's Books and Authors through the library uh, um, research slash literature page, type in the name of a title or an author, and it'll pop up this type of information on your screen where you get a summary of the book, you get a lot of um, keywords and phrases and it gives you a really good idea of what you're getting into before you even crack the page open. You can get reviews on it and while you're on the same page, um, see if the library has it in stock or see other books that might be similar to it. So that's one of my favorite library tools and we're going to jump from that. You see at the bottom it has some read-alikes that, that, that are suggested for people who like the ocean at the end of the lane. And that leads us right into our book shout out of the night. So for tonight's book shout out, we chose The Berry Giant um, by Kazuo Ishiguro. Um, it's, another, it's another book that really touches on these ideas of memory and remembrance and who we are and how we define ourselves with memories. Uh, really great book. Uh, it's Nobel Prize winner. So definitely check this one out. It is currently available in the library, hard copy, uh, ebook copy, audiobook, all the editions are available. So highly recommend checking that out. Oh, you know, Lisa, what I just saw is, I believe Ishiguro is going to be, for the National Book Festival through the Library of Congress, he's gonna be one of the featured authors this year. And something that oh. is really cool is actually that they, a lot of them in the last few years, they've been showing the broadcasts online. So if somebody's interested in that, they might want to check out loc.gov to see if they can check his out his presentation. Uh, I think that's coming up maybe next week or next weekend. So, oh, I see somebody in the audience is reading this book. So if you wanted to check that out, go to loc.gov. I just saw that this week. Oh, Miss Amanda, I think we lost your audio. There we go. Sorry, there it's back. It's back. <laughs> so no, that is a great tip, and I'm gonna check that out and see if I can't get myself some more details on that. So our next little thing that we're gonna talk last thing before we uh, get talking about the book at hand is we're gonna do a real quick poll. Let me pull it up here. All right. Okay, here is our poll, uh, first poll of the evening. We're going to talk about mnemonic. Uh, so what is a mnemonic? Is it half of the title of a 1990s Keanu Reeves movie? Is it a technique used to remember something like Roy G. Biv for The Colors of the Rainbow? Or is it a song featured on The Muppet Show? So go ahead and make your selections on that choose which answer or answers you think might meet that requirement for a mnemonic. So we'll give it another minute here. And three, two, one. All right, so the poll is closed and it looks like you all have a delightful sense of humor. Um, 
It is indeed half of the title of a 1990s Keanu Reeves movie, John E. Mnemonic, but it is also a memory technique used to help you remember something, like Roy G. Biv helping you remember the colors of the rainbow with red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Um, it is not, alas, the song on The Muppet Show, Mana Mana. <laughs> All right. I think that is our last poll option. We're going to do this. There we go. All right. Getting to the book at hand. Miss Amanda, take it away. Okay. So as we kind of, as we go through the book, before we get to the breakout discussion and chatting at the end, these are some things to think about as we read through the sections. So this story is an interesting story where a man revisits some memories from his childhood that he either blocked or remembered differently, and he's confronting that issue. So as the story contrasts the memories of childhood with the narrator's experience of adulthood, how do children perceive things differently from adults? So how do we perceive things even over time, maybe as they were happening as children, and maybe going back with that adult with a different eye, how does it possibly change our perception? And another question is, can you think of times that children are more reliable narrators than adults? So that can be from books, film, experience. We would love to hear your feedback. All right, let's get going. Here we go. Introduction. It was only a duck pond out at the back of the farm. It wasn't very big. Letty Hempstock said it was an ocean, but I knew that was silly. She said they'd come here across the ocean from the old country. Her mother said that Letty didn't remember properly, and it was a long time ago, and anyway, the old country had sunk. Old Mrs. Hempstock, Letty's grandmother, said that they were both wrong and that the place that had sunk wasn't the really old country. She had said she could remember, she said she could remember the really old country. She said the really old country had blown up. Es war nur ein Ententeich, ein Stück weit unterhalb des Bauernhofs, und er war nicht besonders groß. Betty Hemstock behauptete, es sei ein Ozean, aber ich wusste, das war Quatsch. Sie behauptete, sie wären von jenseits des Ozeans hierher gekommen, aus der Heimat. Ihre Mutter sagte, Betty könne sich nicht mehr richtig daran erinnern. Schließlich sei es schon lange her, und außerdem wäre ihre Heimat untergegangen. Die alte Mrs. Hemstock, Lettys Großmutter, behauptete, sie hätten beide Unrecht und das Land, das untergegangen sei, wäre gar nicht ihre Heimat gewesen. Sie sagte, an ihre wirkliche Heimat könne sie sich noch erinnern. Sie behauptete, ihre wirkliche Heimat wäre in die Luft geflogen. Prologue. I wore a black suit and a white shirt, a black tie and black shoes, all polished and shiny. Clothes that normally would make me feel uncomfortable, as if I were in a stolen uniform or pretending to be adult, an adult. Today they gave me comfort of a kind. I was wearing the right clothes for a hard day. I had done my duty in the morning, spoken the words I was meant to speak, and I meant them as I spoke them. And then, when the service was done, I got in my car and I drove, randomly, without a plan, with an hour or so to kill before I met more people I had not seen for years and shook more hands and drank too many cups of coffee for cups of tea from the best china. I drove along winding Sussex County roads I only half remembered until I found myself headed toward the town center. So I turned randomly down another road and took a left and a right. It was only then that I realized where I was going, where I'd been going all along, and I grimaced at my own foolishness. I had been driving towards a house that had not existed for decades. Prolog. Ich trug einen schwarzen Anzug und ein weißes Hemd, eine schwarze Krawatte und schwarze auf Hochglanz polierte Schuhe. Kleider, in denen ich mich normalerweise höchst unwohl gefühlt hätte, wie in einer gestohlenen Uniform oder wie ein Kind, das vorgibt, erwachsen zu sein. Heute waren sie jedoch mit ein Trost. Ich trug die richtigen Kleider für einen schweren Tag. Heute Morgen war ich meiner Pflicht nachgekommen. Ich hatte Worte gefunden, die dem Anlass angemessen waren. Und ich hatte sie ehrlich gemeint. Dann, nach dem Gottesdienst, war ich in mein Auto gestiegen und ziellos durch die Gegend gefahren, weil ich noch eine Stunde totschlagen musste, bevor ich mich wieder mit irgendwelchen Leuten traf, die ich seit Jahren nicht mehr gesehen hatte 
um Hände zu schütteln und aus der Festtagsgeschirr zu viel Tasse Tee zu trinken. Ich fuhr kurvenreiche Landstraße entlang, an die ich mich nur halb erinnerte, durch Sussex, bis ich mich, ohne mir dessen richtig bewusst zu sein, wieder auf dem Rückweg ins Stadtzentrum befand. Also bog ich ab, völlig wahllos, erst nach links, dann nach rechts. Erst da wurde mir bewusst, wohin ich fuhr, wohin ich schon die ganze Zeit übergefahren war. Und ich schüttelte den Kopf über meine eigene Dummheit. Mein Ziel war ein Haus, das seit Jahrzehnten nicht mehr gab. I thought of turning around then, as I drove down a wide street that had once been a flint lane beside a barley field, of turning back and leaving the past undisturbed. But I was curious. The old house, the one I had lived in for seven years, from when I was five until I was 12, that house had been knocked down and was lost for good. The new house, the one my parents had built at the bottom of the garden, between the azalea bushes and the green circle in the grass we called the fairy ring, that had been sold 30 years ago. I slowed the car as I saw the new house. It would, it would always be the new house in my head. I pulled up into the driveway, observing the way they had built out on the mid-70s architecture. I had forgotten that the bricks of the house were chocolate brown. The new people had made my mother's tiny balcony into a two-story sunroom. I stared at the house, remembering less than I had expected about my teenage years. No good times, no bad times. I had lived in that place for a while as a teenager. It didn't seem to be any part of who I was now. I backed the car out of their driveway. Ich überlegte, ob es nicht besser wäre, umzukehren und während ich einer breiten Straße, Straße folgte, die einmal ein Kiesweg gewesen war, der an einem Gerstenfeld entlang geführt hatte, dachte ich, dass es noch immer nicht zu spät wäre, die Vergangenheit auf sich beruhen zu lassen. Aber ich war neugierig. Das alte Haus, in dem ich sieben Jahre lang gewohnt hatte, von, dem, von, von meinem fünften Lebensjahr bis zu meinem zwölften, dieses Haus war längst abgerissen worden. Und das neue Haus, das meine Eltern weiter unten im Garten gebaut hatten, zwischen den Azelienbüschen und dem grünen Kreisengras, den wir den Feenreif nannten, war vor 30 Jahren verkauft worden. Als ich das neue Haus sah, bremste ich ab. Für, für mich würde es immer das neue Haus bleiben. Ich bog in die Einfahrt ein und betrachtete das Gebäude. Ursprünglich im Stil der 70er Jahre errichtet, war es inzwischen mehrfach erweitert geworden. Ich hatte vergessen, dass die Ziegesteine schokoladenbraun waren. Die neuen Bewohner hatten den winzigen Balkon meiner Mutter zu einer zweistöckigen verglasten Veranda umgebaut. Ich starrte das Haus an und musste feststellen, dass ich weniger Erinnerungen an meine Jugendzeit hatte als, erwarten, als erwartet. Weder an gute noch an schlechten Zeiten. Als Teenager hatte ich eine Weile hier gewohnt. Aber mit dem Menschen, der ich jetzt war, schien das alles nichts mehr zu tun haben. Ich fuhr rückwärts aus der Einfahrt. It was time, I knew, to drive to my sister's bustling, cheerful house, all tidied and stiff for the day. I would talk to people whose existence I, I had forgotten years before, and they would ask me about my marriage, failed a decade ago, a relationship that had slowly frayed until eventually, as they always seemed to, it broke. And whether I was seeing anyone, I wasn't. I was not even sure that I could, not yet. And they would ask about my children, all grown up. They had their own lives. They wished they could be here today. Work, doing fine, thank you. I would say, never knowing how to talk about what, what I do, if I could talk about it, I would not have to do it. I make art. Sometimes I make true art. And sometimes it fills the empty spaces in my life. Some of them, not all. We would talk about the departed. We would remember the dead. The little country lane of my childhood had become a black tarmac road that serves as a buffer between two sprawling housing estates. I drove further down, away from the town, which was not the way I should have been traveling, and it felt good. The slick black road became narrower, windier, became the single lane track I remembered from my childhood became packed earth and knobbly, bone-like flints. Soon I was driving, slowly, bumpily, down a narrow lane with brambles and briar roses on each side, wherever the edge was not a strand of hazels or a wild hedgerow. It felt like I had driven back in time, 
That lane was how I remembered it when nothing else was. Es war Zeit, sich zu meiner Schwester zu begeben. In ihrem Haus, das für den heutigen Tag bestimmt festlich herausgeputzt worden war, würde reges Treiben herrschen. Ich würde mich mit Leuten unterhalten, deren Existenz ich schon vor Jahren vergessen hatte. Und sie würden mich nach meiner Frau fragen, von der ich mich vor einem, einem Jahrzehnt, getrennt, Jahrzehnt getrennt hatte. Eine Beziehung, die langsam zerfasert war, bis sie, wie es der Lauf der Dinge zu scheinen sein, in die Brüche gegangen war. Und ob ich eine Freundin hätte? Nein, hatte ich nicht. Ich wusste noch nicht einmal, ob ich dazu in der Lage war. Und sie würden mich nach meinen Kindern fragen, die alle erwachsen waren, die ihr eigenes Leben führte. Und natürlich waren sie, wären sie heute gern gekommen. Nach der Arbeit läuft alles wunderbar. Vielen Dank, würde ich sagen. Ich wusste nie, wie ich über das reden sollte, was ich tat. Wenn ich darüber reden könnte, muss, müsste ich es nicht tun. Ich schaffe Kunst, manchmal sogar richtige Kunst. Und das füllte die Lehrräume in meinem Leben aus. Ein paar davon, nicht alle. Wir würden über die Verblichen reden. Wir würden den Toten gedenken. Das kleine Landsträfchen meiner Kindheit war zu einer schwarzen Asphaltpiste geworden, die zwei weitläufige Wohnsiedlungen miteinander verband. Ich folgte ihr ein Stück weit hinaus aus der Stadt, was nicht die Richtung war, in die ich hätte fahren sollen, und es fühlte sich gut an. Die glatte, schwarze Straße würde schmaler, kürfiger, würde wieder zu einem einspurigen Fahrstreifen, an den ich mich aus meiner Kindheit erinnerte. Aus festgestampfter Erde und knubbeligem, knochenartigem Kies. Bald fuhr ich deutlich langsamer einen holprigen, schmalen Pfad entlang, der von Brombeergestrüpp und Hunsrosen gesäumt war oder von Haselnussstreucheln und anderen wilden Hecken. Ich hatte das Gefühl, in der Zeit zurückzureisen. Der Pfad war noch immer so, wie ich ihn in Erinnerung hatte, auch wenn sich sonst alles verändert hatte. All right, friends, time for another quick poll. Give us a quick little breather from the reading out loud. Let me get that pulled up here for you. And there we go. If you were given the option, Would you want to have a perfect memory? So you can choose yes, no, maybe, or only if you could pick and choose certain moments, or if you wanna, if you have something completely different, feel free to put that in the chat box or in the question box. Uh, but yeah, go ahead and choose what your option would be. For me, it would be mm, probably no, but Maybe if I could pick very specific things that I could pull back out of the, the memory box, that might be nice. But I think in general, for me, that would be a nope. How about you, Miss yeah. Amanda? You know, I think I would also be a no for a perfect memory because certain things, you know, I think the ones that are good, you do retain in more sharper focus than the ones that are bad. You want time to soften the edges. But yeah. You know what I always wonder, wonder in terms of that? In books, and TV and movies, you see a lot of amnesia and photographic memories. I wonder how common those actually are. You know, uh, I would, well, I wonder what the percentage, I'll have to look that up somewhere, the uh, the percentage of actual photographic memories out there. I would um, suspect it's not nearly as common as TV would lead us to believe. <laughs> it's not as common as a plot device uh, to describe people's actions. I think the same with uh, amnesia, that seems to come up. I wonder the, 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 real, the real stats on amnesia there. One um, bump on the head and you've forgotten your whole life. Yeah, it looks like, the, it looks like the audience far. agrees with us, though, in terms of the option of having a perfect memory. Well, I think, you know, I think it would be one of those ones that would be hard. You'd be hard pressed to find a lot of people that would maybe for the middle of exams or preparing for Jeopardy, it would seem more appealing. <laughs> but, but I think in real practical life, not so much. Yeah, for sure. All right, are you ready to get going with the rest of our story here for yeah, a bit? Let's see, let's see where we're going here. Yes. I drove past Caraway Farm. I remember being just 16 and kissing red-cheeked, fair-haired Callianders who lived there and whose family would soon move to the Shetlands and I would never kiss or see her again. Then nothing but fields on either side of the road for almost a mile a tangle of meadows, 
Slowly, the lane became a track. It was reaching its end. I remembered it before I saw the corner, before I turned the corner and saw it. In its all its dilapidated red brick glory, the Hempstock's farmhouse. It took me by surprise, although that was where the lane had always ended. I could have gone no further. I parked the car at the side of the farmyard. I had no plan. I wondered whether, after all these years, there was anyone still living there, or, more precisely, if the Hempstocks were still living there. It seemed unlikely, but then, from what little I remembered, they had been unlikely people. The stench of cow muck struck me as I got out of the car, and I walked, gingerly, across the small yard to the front door. I looked for a doorbell, in vain, and then I knocked. The door had been not been latched properly, and it swung gently open as I wrapped it with my knuckles. Ich fuhr in der Caraway Farm vorbei. Als ich gerade 16 gewesen war, hatte ich Carly Anders geküsst, die dort gewohnt hatte, ein Mädchen mit roten Wangen und blondem Haar. Kurz darauf war ihre Familie nach Schottland gezogen und ich hatte sie nie wieder geküsst und auch nie wieder gesehen. Schließlich erstreckten sich fast eine Meile weit beiderseits des Weges nichts als Wälder. Flache Wiesen gingen nahtlos ineinander über. Aus dem Kiesberg wurde ein besserer Trampelpfad. Bald würde er zu Ende sein. Ich erinnerte mich daran, bevor ich um die Kurve bog, und dann stand es da, in seiner ganzen verfallenen Pracht, ein rotes Backsteingebäude, das Gehöft der Hemstocks. Obwohl der Weg hier immer schon geendet, ge geendet hatte, war ich doch überrascht. Weiter hätte ich nicht fahren können. Ich parkte den Wagen vor dem Haus. Etwas Bestimmtes hatte ich nicht vor. Ich fragte mich, ob hier nach all den Jahren noch jemand wohnte oder genauer gesagt, ob die Hemstocks noch hier wohnten. Das war eher unwahrscheinlich, allerdings waren die Hemstocks immer für eine Überraschung gut gewesen. Als ich ausstieg, roch es durchdringend nach Kuhmist. Ich ging vorsichtig über den kleinen Hof zur Haustür hinüber, suchte vergebens nach einer Türklingel und klopfte dann. Die Tür war nicht richtig ins Schloss gedrückt worden und schwang langsam auf. I had been here, hadn't I? A long time ago. I was sure I had. Childhood memories are sometimes covered and obscured beneath the things that come later, like childhood toys forgotten at the bottom of a crammed adult closet. But they are never lost for good. I stood in the hallway and called, Hello? Is anybody there? I heard nothing. I smelled bread baking and wax furniture polish and old wood. My eyes were slow to adjust to the darkness. I peered into it, was getting ready to turn and leave when an elderly woman came out of the dim hallway holding a white duster. She wore her gray hair long. I said, Mrs. Hemstock? She tipped her head to one side, looked at me. Yes, I do know you, young man, she said. I am not a young man, not any longer. I know you, but these things get messy when you get to my age. Who are you exactly? I think I must have been about seven, maybe eight the last time I was here. She smiled then. You were Luddy's friend from the top of the lane. You gave me milk. It was warm from the cows. And then I realized how many years had gone by. And I said, no, you didn't do that. That must have been your mother who gave me the milk. I'm sorry. As we age, we become our parents. Live long enough and we see faces repeat in time. I remembered Mrs. Hemstock, Luddy's mother, as a stout woman. This woman was stick thin and she looked delicate. She looked like her mother, like the woman I had known as old Mrs. Hemstock. Hier war ich doch schon einmal vor langer Zeit. Eigentlich war ich mir sicher, Kindheitserinnerungen liegen manchmal unter den Dingen verborgen, die später passiert sind. Wie Spielzeug, das vergessen auf dem Boden eines Kleiderschranks liegt, aber nie ganz verloren ist. Ich stand in der Diele und rief, Hallo, irgendjemand zu Hause? Ich hörte nichts. Es roch nach frisch gebackenem Brot und Möbelwachs und altem Holz. Meine Augen gewöhnten sich nur langsam an die Dunkelheit. Ich wollte gerade wieder gehen, als eine ältere Frau auf den Hausflur trat, 
in der Hand ein weißes Schaubtuch. Ihre graue Haaren trug sie lang. Mrs. Hemstock? fragte ich. Sie legte den Kopf le leicht schräg und musterte mich. Junger Mann, von irgendwoher kenne ich Sie, sagte sie. Ich bin kein junger Mann, schon lange nicht mehr. Ich, ich kenne Sie, aber in, in meinem Alter geht so manches durcheinander. Wer genau sind Sie? Ich glaube, ich muss so sieben oder acht gewesen sein, als ich das letzte Mal hier war. Da lächelte sie. Sie waren mit Letty befreundet und haben oben an der Landstraße gewohnt. Sie haben mir Milch zu trinken gegeben, noch warm von den Kühen. Da, da wurde mir bewusst, wie viele Jahre vergangen waren und ich sagte, nein, das waren sie nicht, das, das muss ihre Mutter gewesen sein, tut mir leid. Werden wir, wir Eltern, werden wir, wir zu unseren Eltern. Wenn man lange genug lebt, sieht man die Gesichter seiner Jugend wieder. Ich erinnerte mich an Mrs. Hemstock, Lettys Mutter, als eine stämmige Frau. Diese Frau war dürr und zierlich. Sie sah aus wie ihre Mutter, die Frau, die ich als die alte Mrs. Hemstock gekannt hatte. Okay, we are up to our next resource shout out. And this is one we have actually shouted out before. If you have attended any of our programs, you will know Hoopla well, but we love to recommend it because it has so many different great resources. So in the past, we've talked about eBooks, streaming audio books. We've talked about uh, movies and TV. And today we're gonna focus a little bit on the Neil Gaiman act or the Neil Gaiman entities they have it, it does cross several uh several different of the genres here of different different of the types of materials and one thing we do want to focus on is you can see here uh if you type in neil gaiman you search across the different uh different areas you know ebooks audiobooks you will see that you'll come up with some different book type of, you know i see an audiobook and an ebook here but something i do want to point out that is one of their specific categories for hoopla is comic books so, of course, the famous Sandman comic books from Neil Gaiman, The Eternals uh, from Neil Gaiman, a lot of his books, uh, a lot of, you'll be able to also find the comics and the origins for a lot of the ones that have been recently turned into streaming limited series or have been turned into movies or different TV, TV options. So something you might want to check out is if you are a graphic novel fan, we have a really great collection of graphic novels here on Hoopla that you can stream anytime digitally. And really, I will say they have really enhanced the viewing experience of reading a comic online. I know it's usually one of those tactile things, but this one, they've really Im increased the uh, browser and the device viewing experience for reading a comic. So we would definitely recommend checking that out if you are a graphic novel fan or if you've always meant to get into graphic novels. Or if it's been a while since you've tried it, the, the interface really has come a long way if you tried it maybe yeah. a few years ago and, and haven't since. So definitely recommend no, giving that a, a go. It really has. It really has. So definitely, and you can find Hoopla, our streaming service at hcplc.org slash ebooks, and that will take you to Hoopla. All right, let's get on with the last little bit of our story here that we're going to touch on. Sometimes when I look in the mirror, I see my father's face, not my own. And I remember the way he would smile at himself in mirrors before he went out. Looking good, he'd say to his reflection approvingly. Looking good. Are you here to see Letty? Mrs. Hempstock asked. Is she here? The idea surprised me. She had gone somewhere, hadn't she? America? The old woman shook her head. I was just about to put the kettle on. Do you fancy a spot of tea? I hesitated. Then I said that, if she didn't mind, I'd like if she could point me toward the duck pond first. Duck pond? I knew Letty had had a funny name for it. I remember that. She called it the sea, something like that. The old woman put the cloth down on the dresser. Can't drink the water from the sea, can you? Too salty like drinking life's blood. Do you remember the way? You can get to it around the side of the house. Just follow the path. Manchmal, wenn ich in den Spiegel schaue, sehe ich das Gesicht meines Vaters, nicht meines. Und dann fällt mir ein, wie er manchmal seinem Spiegelbild zugelächelt hatte, bevor er aus dem Haus gegangen war. Sieht gut aus, hat er dann beifällig gesagt. Sieht gut aus. 
Möchten Sie Letty besuchen? fragte Mrs. Hamstock. Ist sie hier? Damit hatte ich nicht gerechnet. Sie war doch bestimmt irgendwohin ausgewandert. Nach Amerika vielleicht? Die alte Frau schüttelt, schüttelte den Kopf. Ich wollte gerade Wasser aufsetzen. Möchten Sie eine Tasse Tee? Ich zögerte, dann bat ich sie, mir, wenn es ihr nichts ausmache, den Weg zum Ententeich zu beschreiben. Ententeich? Ich wusste, dass Letty einen seltsamen Namen dafür gehabt hatte. Und er fiel mir auch wieder ein. Sie hat es, sie hat ihn das Meer genannt. Irgendwas in der Art. Die alte Frau legte das Tuch auf die Kommode. Das Wasser aus dem Meer kann man nicht trinken, weil es zu salzig ist. Habe ich recht? Das wäre, als würde man Blut trinken. Sie wissen nicht mehr, wie man dorthin kommt. Um, um das Haus herum. Und dann den Pfad entlang. If you'd asked me an hour before, I would have said, no, I did not remember the way. I did not even think I would have remembered Letty Hemstock's name. But standing in that hallway, it was all coming back to me. Memories were waiting at the edges of things, beckoning to me. Had you told me that I was seven again, I might have half believed you for a moment. Thank you. I walked into the farmyard. I went past the chicken coop, past the old barn and along the edge of the field, remembering where I was and what was coming next and exulting in the knowledge. Hazels lined the side of the meadow. I picked a handful of the green nuts and put them in my pocket. The pond is next, I thought. I just have to go around the shed and I'll see it. I saw it and felt oddly proud of myself, as if that one act of memory had blown away some of the cobwebs of the day. Hätte mich jemand noch vor einer Stunde gefragt, hätte ich gesagt, ich wüsste nicht mehr, wie man dorthin kommt. Wahrscheinlich hätte ich mich nicht einmal mehr an Letty Hamstocks Namen erinnert. Aber wie ich da im Hausflur stand, fiel mir alles wieder ein. Erinnerungen, die lauerten hinter jeder Ecke, geradezu verlockend. Hätte mir jemand gesagt, ich wäre wieder sieben Jahre alt, hätte ich ihm vielleicht einen Moment lang geglaubt. Vielen Dank. Ich ging wieder auf den Hof hinaus, vorbei am Hühnerstall und an der alten Scheune. Während ich an den Feldern entlang schlenderte, fiel mir ein, wo ich mich befand und was als nächstes kommen würde. Und dieses Wissen ließ mich innerlich frohlocken. Haselstreicher säumten den Weg. Ich hob eine Handvoll grüner Nüsse auf und steckte sie ein. Bis zum Teich ist es nicht mehr weit, dachte ich bei mir. Ich muss nur noch diesen Schuppen umrunden und dann sehe ich ihn. Ich sah ihn und war merkwürdig stolz auf mich, als hätte, das, als hätte die Tatsache, dass ich dieses eine Erinnerung hervorgekramt hatte, einen Teil der Spinnweben des heutigen Tages weggeblasen. The pond was smaller than I remembered. There was a little wooden shed on the far side and by the path, an ancient heavy wood and metal bench. The peeling wooden slats had been painted green a few years ago. I sat on the bench and stared at the reflection of the sky in the water, at the scum of the duckweed at the edges and the half dozen lily pads. Every now and again, I tossed a hazelnut into the middle of the pond. The pond that Letty Headenstock had called It wasn't the sea, was it? She would be older than I am now, Letty Hemstock. She was only a handful of years older than, than I was back then, for all her funny talk. She was 11. I was, what was I? It was after the bad birthday, I knew that, so I would have been seven. I wonder if, if we had ever fallen in the water. Had I pushed her into the duck pond, that strange girl who lived in the farm at the very bottom of the lane? I remembered her being in the water. Perhaps she had pushed me in too. Where did she go? America? No, Australia, that was it. Somewhere a long way away. And it wasn't the sea, it was the ocean, Letty Hemstock's ocean. I remembered that and remembering that, I remembered everything. Der Teich war kleiner als ich ihn in Erinnerung hatte. Am gegenüberliegenden Ufer stand ein Holzschuppen und neben dem Bad eine uralte Bank aus Holz und Metall. Von den Brettern blätterte die grüne Farbe ab. Ich setzte mich auf die Bank und starrte in das Wasser, in dem sich der Himmel spiegelte. 
zauf die Entenkreuze am Ufer und das halbe Dutzend Lilienblätter. Hin und wieder warf ich eine Haselnuss in die Mitte des Teichs in, wie hatte Letty Hemstock ihn genannt? Nein, mehr, mehr war es nicht gewesen. Sie musste älter sein als ich, Letty Hemstock. Damals war sie vielleicht fünf Jahre älter als ich, trotz ihres komischen Geredes. Sie war elf, ich war... Wie alt war ich gewesen? Das war nach dieser schrecklichen Geburtstagsfeier. Das wusste ich noch. Also war ich wohl sieben. Ich fragte mich, ob wir jemals ins Wasser gefallen waren. Hatte ich sie in den Ententeich geschubst, dieses seltsame Mädchen, das auf dem Bauernhof am untersten Ende der Straße wohnte? Ich erinnere mich, sie im Wasser gesehen zu haben. Vielleicht hatte sie mich auch hineingestoßen? Wohin war sie gegangen? Nach Amerika? Nein, nach Australien, das war es, irgendwo weit weg. Und es hatte nicht das Meer geheißen, sondern der Ozean. Letty Hemstocks Ozean. Das fiel mir wieder ein und als mir das einfiel, erinnerte ich mich auch wieder an alles andere. And scene. We're going to pause for a moment, have a quick poll and uh, get into some discussion points here in a moment. So well, let's launch our poll here. Who do the hemstocks remind you of? We've only touched a little bit on, uh, we've only met the one and we've heard descriptions of some of the others. Uh, but based on those descriptions, do they remind you of anyone? Um, maybe the fates from Greek mythology, maybe a little more recent from A Wrinkle in Time, Mrs. Who, Mrs. What, Mrs. Which. Maybe something else entirely. Maybe you're not sure yet, not enough to go on just yet. I think for me that there's a, a certain resemblance to the, that old uh, uh, maiden mother crone uh, uh, aspect of things. You know, the what walks on four legs in the morning, two in the afternoon, or three in the evening kind of a, a riddle. That's that's the vibe that I get from it. You know, I don't know if they necessarily reminded me of any, or if there was any literary illusions there for me, but I will say I do get very early in the book, even now where it's more based in reality or the present, I should say, I always have to have feelings that they were out of time, timeless. They were, they were always described as very old worldly, something that kind of was anachronistic to even yeah. when the author was growing up and, and, you know, they kind of give that, gave that, Five to me. Yeah. All right. Let's see what the audience says. Oh, it looks like a lot of people are getting some Greek mythology vibes from it so far. So I, I can definitely see that. I can definitely see that. All right. I'm going to go ahead and close this out. I, I, I love this, uh, this old, this, this carving here. I, I don't know how old it is, but it definitely has the Greek fates on here. So. Love that nice. image. All right, Miss Amanda, tell us a little something about this. Okay, for our final resource shout out this evening, of course we did, Lisa, I have to give you the credit for this famous quote, but I think it's one that librarians, I think every librarian loves, which is Google can bring you back 100,000 answers, a librarian can bring you back the right one. And I know I've paraphrased this several times in my library career. <laughs> so our final shout out is for our service Ask a Librarian. This is where you can connect with us. Uh, you can connect with us through text, chat, email. And we've actually had the service. It seems very prescient that we would have this through the pandemic, but this is actually a long standing service of not only our library system, but many library systems have this electronic Ask a Librarian service. So you can connect if you can go, you can go to hcplc.org slash about slash contact, and you can connect with a librarian in any one of these three virtual ways to get the reference you need. So as I love this Ask a Librarian, the human search engine, and that really is what the library is and library staff, the search engines, the, the human ones. Before there was the digital web-based search engines, you had, you had reference staff. And I think this really does kind of um, speak to the fact that more is not always more. You know, you don't want 
the information you want the right answers you don't want a ton of information so that is still part and parcel to the trade helping people find the right answers the right path the right directions and the right resources to get them where they need to be so i love this if you do need, do need to connect with the librarian and you can't get into the branch please feel free to check out ask a librarian and the you know the other thing i love about this is that it's not some anonymous person out somewhere in the world answering your question or a, a, a robot answering your questions this is people from your local uh, hillsborough county public library staff that is answering oh. your questions it's one of my favorite shifts is when i've gotten to work work these shifts and talking to our patrons virtually so you are that getting in point. Yeah, yeah you're getting your local staff through this all right discussion time Okay, so to revisit, uh, if you remember our discussion questions, this is a lot about, the story has a lot about memory and revisiting the past, especially for many years on, many years into adulthood. So the questions that we did pose are, how do children, how do children perceive things differently from adults? And can you think of times that children are more reliable narrators than adults? Whether, and that can be books, movies, general literature, real life situations. How can that, how are, what are some examples of that? So we'll go ahead and invite people to post their answers, comments, or questions into that question section where we, we will read those out loud and get started on the conversation. Shall we go ahead and turn our cameras back on, Lisa, as we get into the discussion? Here we go. Oh, there, mine was a little slow coming back. I was a little worried there. Okay. Well, I think also we're just kind of on the, just as he's on the edge of the pond, we are on the edge of really diving into the story of this book, but kind of to give a little preview without spoiler, it does revisit a lot more of his memories of his childhood and kind of he's grappling with, are his memories incorrect or was, you know, which, which was, has he blocked out memories? Did he remember it differently? Is this really the way it happened? And I think really experiences, it, it is interesting with memory, things can come to light that change your perceptions at the time mm -hmm. where, you know, not having all the information. There is also, I like this as I, as I alluded to before, there is kind of that classic Neil Gaiman, that is a little bit of a spooky underworld, otherworldly other undertone as well. So the, it's, um, it is on the scale of Neil Gaiman, it kind of means not quite straight Coraline, but in the direction of Coraline, maybe the way kind of that, to me, yeah. that's Anyway, definitely um into that alternate alternate uh universe or parallel almost parallel universe not not exactly the same way as Coraline, but it gives me that kind of feeling so the, the slightly well, swoopy yeah slightly swoopy hence our hence our he was in morning <laughs> we're wearing our morning black we're wearing our slightly spooky um what do you think though how do children perceive things differently from adults I, there's, I think there's definitely that element of kids come at things without expectation. It's I, I agree. You know, I think something also is uh, not just expectation, but I think when you are a child, you take a lot of things for granted because you assume there's missing information to that broader world you don't know, and you take a lot of things at face value. Mm -hmm. I just remember that a lot when I was a kid, where or even at like a good class. Gosh, I wish I could think of one now. A good classic example is like misheard lyrics. Because, you know, you'd say lyrics and you're like, well, I assume that's just a phrase adults know or something you're like, oh, that's a term like adults know. And I'm just I'm singing these words, which I think is something, but I later found out was nothing. And I think I think kids consciously or so maybe subconsciously take things a little bit at face value with the, the, the idea of like, well, if it doesn't make sense to me, it's probably just I don't know about that yet or I don't. Uh, it, you don't question things because you're like, well, everybody, you know, one day I'll learn about this thing, you know, so. Clearly so. all of the people who know what they're doing think this is a thing. Exactly. Oh, we do have a, oh, we have a comment from the audience. How wonderful. So it says, even in the act of, rem even the act of remembrance warps what you remember as your brain fills in the blanks. So I guess adults in some ways have a less reliable memory. Also kids are at a different level height wise. Each age group is just, Oops, I gotta, I gotta go about this. Just notes what they think is the most important or significant. Oh, that is a good point. Um, and I think in general, the reliability of memory is always, you, know, you kind of see those court procedurals and it's, it's proven like really a lot the of- reliable eyewitness. 
Exactly. Our brain is filling a lot of those details and background. You know, it's like those things like the background are, oh, your brain is just assuming or filling in what, what makes sense at the time or what, what would have made sense, which is interesting about the power of the human brain, but um, a little more troublesome when it comes to memory, the, re the reliability of memory. And I think there is also the conscious act of um, remembering things better than they were or worse than they were, depending, you know, depending on what the, the act or the time, mm -hmm. the time was, I think there is a way, um, this is getting into a very different territory, but I recently read a book by a Holocaust survivor who survived the Holocaust as a, a young teen and child. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is he wrote his first book of memoirs at like the age of 17 or 18. And then he had later rewritten his memoirs well into adulthood. And he said, he said even at the time, um, you know, writing them as an adult was much different because it was less fresh. But there was also that canon already of the historical his perspective of this event. So this was something very specific. But I think that once you go back to even something, it could be any, any epic in time, you know, it could be whatever. Once there's other media, other writing, other in there, there is just that, um, you know, it is easy to, to, or it's harder to figure out, is that something that I know, or is that something I've read, or is that something that is, is subconsciously there? It's do like, I remember this, or do I remember people talking about it? Exactly. I was just going to say that for, um, for kids, a lot of times, I think even... You, it's hard to know when your earliest memory was because you see a lot of pictures of yourself. And do I remember this moment when I was sitting on my grandmother's lap or do I just remember seeing this picture so many mm -hmm. times? So I think that's something that is interesting that can happen to kids or adults uh, in terms of, um, you know, memory being different. Uh, but can you, Lisa, can you think of any times where kids are a more reliable narrator? A kid will always give it to you straight, which is why a kid can give you the greatest compliment you've ever had in your life, but they can also cut you to the core That's because you know, you know that what they're We're saying so is the most honest and heartfelt thing that's popping out of their, their mouth in that moment. That prefrontal cortex has not filtered anything yet. <laughs> Brutal honesty. I believe you're right. I think a lot of times it, it does tend to be in I think a lot of times kids too, or like, uh, you know, a, a kind of a classic example is, you know, say you're, you're with, you know, mom, dad, older sibling or whatever, and you're not supposed to stop and get ice cream and you're not supposed to do this. And you kind of maybe bend it, you're, you, you were bending the rules a little bit, you mm -hmm. know, ask, ask the older person who's like, oh, maybe I should improve the truth a little, ask the kid, well, we did this and we did this and we did this and we did this. So I think there is that, I think there is that. Can you think of it? I'm trying to think of a time when maybe in a book they used a child as a narrator. Um, oh, actually, a book a lot about memory narration, children versus adulthood would be Atonement by Ian McEwen. And that is really about like perception. And um, that's a really interesting. It's not really it's not a read alike by any means. But if you are yeah. interested in exploring these topics and those those uh, things, that would be a good read for that. Them. Okay. Do we have any more audience points on it that? Looks like we do not, happens. but I have appreciated that audience perspective tonight. Good job. Yeah, that that is also a good point about the, the the physical difference between what the kids perceive versus what the adults perceive, just from a a different literal actual point of view. True. So, that is true. Um, and as the story goes on. Um, without spoiling it for anyone that does come into play a little bit too as to what a child saw from his eye level in the things that he was looking for versus what the parent might have seen um with the same with the same situation they were confronted with so that does come up again a little bit more um but yeah it definitely plays into the the, the spoopy element of it a bit more all right, folks, I think we're going to pop on over to our contact card here. Make sure everyone knows how to get in touch with us at 813-273-3652. We went over a lot of this with the Ask a Librarian page, but you can always reach us there. But 
as much as we love telling you stories uh, and reading stories to you, we'd also like to hear about your stories. So always feel free to tell us about what what you experienced with the program or in one of our library branches that you visited. Uh, tell, tell us your story, hcplc.org slash about slash stories. We would love to hear about your experience um, and check out more of our upcoming virtual programs uh, on hcplc.org slash events. Wonderful. Okay, well, that will bring us to a close tonight. So, good night. Thank you for joining us. Good night, everyone. We'll see you soon. Have a good weekend. Bye.